Hi there, I'm Ryan Ellis, and I'm doing a video project on all that I've learned by 28. Now, I'm going to talk about what I've learned about human rights. Let's start out with a thought exercise. Imagine you were in a cave before your birth as a soul with 10 other souls, and you could communicate with these other souls. And you didn't know where, to whom, or which gender you'd end up being born as. Now, together with these other 10 souls, your task is to discuss and agree on the way that the world should be. And once you agree, then you can be placed in your bodies and go on with your lives. In this world, these souls would probably create a world in which there is some sense of equality of opportunity, if not equality. In this world, you'd have to ask yourself, would you want to prevent some people from traveling and having freedom of movement? Uh, or enabling everyone to be able to move around as they wish? Would you prevent people from traveling freely simply based on where they were born? In this hypothetical philosophical world, would you have some people living on less than a dollar a day or a dollar and a half or two dollars a day, effectively in extreme poverty without access to opportunity, while other people are living on a thousand per day? In this world, if you could afford to, would you want to ensure that everyone had access to some basic human needs like food, water, and shelter? Or just a few of you have access to food, water, and shelter? And in this world, would you provide access to basic education, basic medicine, just to some of the people, uh, or to some of the children, or to all of the people, or to all of the children? And if you could, would you want to make sure that all the infants around the world had life-saving immunizations and medical care, or just reserve those treatments for some of the people? Would you condemn children, babies, and people to death because access to leading cancer treatments just simply weren't available in those parts of the world? These are all important questions to think about. What type of world would you create if you didn't know where you would be born, or to whom you would be born, or what type of access to opportunity. Well, here's the secret. This is the world we actually can create, a world in which everyone has access to basic human needs. And we now have enough wealth, and enough opportunity, and enough systems in our world to be able to create a structure such that everyone has access to food, water, shelter, basic education, basic medicine, electricity, the internet, and basic sanitation. We can have a world in which free spirit and enterprise is encouraged. We can have a world in which property rights are respected, a world in which governments are run efficiently and transparently, a world in which businesses are run ethically, and a world in which every child is given the ability to learn, to innovate, to create, to contribute, and to be a leader, and to pass on what they've learned to others. I see a world ahead that we can create as a species, as a generation, as Gen Y, over the next 30 or 40 years, a world in which every child is assured access to their basic needs. This pyramid here sort of looks like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but really what it is is a pyramid of your basic, most important needs that you need to be able to survive, create, to innovate, and to be a full human being with your full potential unlocked. And at the end of the day, if we can go from unlocking the full human potential of just a third of the human species to over 9 billion people in the next 40 years whose basic human needs are met, imagine the job creation, imagine the innovation that we can see as a human species. So you might ask, well, if we actually can create this world in our lifetime, what's stopping us? Why, why, not we, why don't we just get to work? Well, the reality is, is that over the past couple hundred years, we've made amazing, tremendous positive progress in improving human life expectancy, reducing infant mortality, and creating a world in which people have more than they could before. We're creating a world in which there's a lot less extreme poverty than before. In the next section on World 2050, we'll talk about those trends, and we'll define some key global KPIs in the global KPI section. An interesting thinker in this space is a guy named Buckminster Fuller, and he once said, asking the question, how do we make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological damage or disadvantage to anyone? How do we truly create a secure, safe, prosperous world for all? And I really do believe if we could ensure basic human needs for everyone, we will have a world that is more secure for us here as Americans and all of us around the world. 
So let's take a quick look at how many people and what percentage of humanity does not currently have access to those seven basic human needs that we've defined. So let's take a look at this table and we'll start with clean water. Today according to UNICEF, 780 million humans are without access to clean water. Now we run the tap here and we are sort of not surprised at all when clean drinkable water comes right out. In fact, we go to the bathroom in gallons of clean water every single day and yet there are people who don't have access to clean water within 20 kilometers of them, sometimes even more. So 11% of the world. How many people don't have access to sufficient food to be able to power their bodies and provide energy they need to live, to survive, to have a strong immune system? Well, that's 925 million people according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 13.2%. Imagine if you didn't have enough food and enough water, what you might be willing to do to protect yourself or protect your family. The third is basic shelter. One billion people or a thousand million people don't have access to basic, generally sufficient shelter to cover themselves from the weather elements and to protect their family, 14% of the world. In fact, there are about a billion people worldwide currently living in slums in urban areas that are densely populated and often don't have basic things like sanitation, running water, and electricity. Next, let's look at some of, uh, one of the factors that correlates with basic education, and that's literacy. Now, if you can't read or write, there are a lot of things in this world that just simply aren't open to you. And there are today still 920 million people globally, according to UNESCO, that do not have the ability to read or write. 13% of the world. Next, let's look at basic medicine. According to the World Health Organization, 1.7 billion human beings don't have access to life-saving preventative measures and basic immunizations that can save their life. Now, we've made a lot of progress with reducing infant mortality, but if nearly one in four humans don't have access to the most basic of medicines we consider commonplace in every day, that's some, something's wrong with that. Let's talk next about electricity. Electricity was discovered in the 19th century, and during our section coming up on innovation, we'll talk more about electromagnetism, the electromagnetic spectrum, the light bulb, the incandescent light, filaments. But even 120, 130 years after the discovery of something like the incandescent light bulb in 1879 by Thomas Edison, we still have 1.3 billion people, according to the International Energy Agency, 18.5% of the world who do not have access the basic power. Now I've got an investment in a company in Kampala, Uganda called Village Energy that's working to provide solar power energy to rural villages um, and that enables you to not only provide enough light to read and work on but the ability to charge your cell phone and power your radio as well. There, it's companies like that and it's innovation and it's a concerted effort that will be required to get electricity to the remaining 1.3 billion people. Imagine if you went home at night after school or after work and as soon as the sun set you couldn't read. You couldn't do anything further. You couldn't play headphones. You couldn't listen to music. You couldn't watch TV. Life would be very different. And that's the current case for 1.3 billion people. And finally, let's look at internet access. Or at West, we like to just simply call it the cloud. Today, there are about 2.1 billion people with access to the cloud. And what that means is there are about 4.9 billion people, nearly 70% of humanity, that does not have access to the internet. Now, you can imagine what the internet has already changed in your life in terms of your access to opportunity, your access to people, your access to information and to education. And it really seen amazing stories of what happens when an individual who previously didn't have access to something as simple as Wikipedia suddenly gets access. The innovative spirit within suddenly has access to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of human innovation, experience, and engineering knowledge. And they, at that point, can then truly create anything they get their mind toward and have the blueprints to build anything and to do anything and to be anyone. So I would argue that in the future, the internet, access to the internet on a smart device should be a basic human right. And fortunately, the marginal cost of providing additional internet access is very low. And so I think we'll see in our lifetime, over the next 30 years, everyone have access to the internet. And I can't wait. And so we, ha we can see some of the trends recently in increased access to safe drinking water, now 89%, but there's still 11% without access to clean water. 
We can see the rapid growth of the internet in which now 31% uh, almost have access to the cloud. This is a great growth curve. And if you just project this out, maybe 30 years from now, everyone will have access to the internet. But is 30 years really quick enough? Is there something we can do as a species that provides internet access to everyone in the next 10 years? These are important questions to ask as you think about this world that together we can form and create. We immensely owe, as a young generation, our ancestors and our forebears and the people that have come before us, that have fought wars, that have worked hard, that have worked, that have innovated, that have allocated capital, that have used their innovative minds to be able to create the innovations, technologies, and societal structures necessary to enable us as Gen Y to actually have the opportunity to create a world in which everyone has access to basic needs. And I believe when we create that world, amazing things will happen. One question, though, to ask is, what if there were a simple document, maybe like the Doc Declaration of Independence, that established the rights of humans and that the United States and 48 other countries have adopted? Well, the reality is, is that document actually does exist. And it was created in 1948. And it's called the Universal Declaration of Rights. And it was formed by the United Nations in the late 1940s and adopted by the USA and 48 other countries. And there are simple articles in here, starting with all human beings are born free and equal, and that everyone is entitled to the same rights without discrimination of any kind. And that everyone, regardless of where you're from or who you are, has the right to life, liberty, and security. I, take, I encourage you to take a look at this full universal declaration of human rights. It's something that we're often not taught in grade school or middle school and high school in the United States. But it's one of the most important documents underlining the way the world can be in the future. And it's a document used uh, at the United Nations right now to think about how we focus our resources as a global society to create a better, more secure, safer world for yourself and your family and your kids in the future. The second part of the Universal Declaration ends up with these 15 articles. They have a total of 30 articles. I'd encourage you to take a look. That is the end of this section on human rights and philosophy. Thank you very much for helping work to create a world in which everyone has access to basic needs. Thank you.